Hello and a warm welcome to today's AES history presentation. Today's session will be delivered by Mr. Morrell, so over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Welcome back to our fourth week uh, looking at history AS level and accelerated sessions. This session is going to focus on the essay writing skills of unit one, particularly then developing our kind of reasoned arguments, which are key to our uh, top marks at unit one. Now, hopefully one of these topics here will apply to you. We uh, in unit one have eight different options. And so there are eight different topics. And um, so as pre as with the previous sessions, we won't be covering specifics of the topic, but more that general skill outline. But nevertheless, you should hopefully be doing either Government Rebellion Society in Wales and England, 1483 to 1605, or Government Revolution and Society in, in Wales and England, 1603 to 1715. Politics, Protest and Reform in Wales and England, 1780 to 1880. Politics, People and Progress in Wales and England, 1880 to 1980. Political and Religious Change in Europe, 1500 to 1598. Europe in the Age of Absolutism and Revolution. Revolution and New Ideas in Europe and Europe in the Age of Conflict and Cooperation. You'll be doing one of those for Unit 1. Unit 1 being that one that has those two essay questions at the end as the kind of assessment and not those sources or interpretation questions, which Miss Thomas did in our first two sessions. Now, as I said in previous sessions, my uh, specialism, what I teach here in Clinidlois, is European Age of Conflict and Cooperation. So I have used a bit more examples from that option than the other options. However, the ideas, the skills, the way you write an essay are absolutely as relevant across all of these options as they are to option eight. The way you write an essay for option eight is the same as it is for the way you write it for option five, because it's the same mark scheme across all of these options. So we're going to jump straight in and we'll be thinking about what kinds of things are the examiners looking for and in this kind of process now of evidence gathering what your teachers or lecturers in your schools and sixth form colleges are looking for. So where do marks come from? Well marks come from what we call band characteristics. Now the biggest struggle I found so far and I think history teachers uh, elsewhere would, may agree as well, the biggest struggle often is to get out of band three, right, which is 11 to 15 marks out of 30. To get out of that is quite a hurdle because you're focusing on some key things like judgments and debates. Once you've got out of that, it's a case of practicing and you can move up those bands actually quite speedily in some ways. So what do I mean? What, what does band three characteristics mean? What does that mean to you and me? Well, as it says here, it means the response has some focus on the key issue set and begins to discuss those to come to a judgment on the question set. What does that mean? Well, it means you discuss the question set, but probably don't cover the whole time period. You may have only covered part of the time period, or your focus has been a bit skewed, and it's more, much more focused on an earlier or later period of the time period. The response is usually restricted to a for and against discussion with some evidence of listing and unloading of notes. So there's very limited analysis. You haven't got much of on the one hand and however on the other hand. It's just a for and against this happened and this happened. When they talk about unloading notes, it means it sounds like a story. It's reading like a story. That's not what our examiners want. And finally, there may well be some considerable drift and there may well be a mechanistic tone to the response. That means that the answer isn't mainly focused on the concept in the question. You know, I'd see it if I get papers back, if you know, students get pa papers back, they'll write NAQTS at the side, not answering the question set. That means you've drifted away from the specific question that they have set you. They don't want you to just unload your notes. They don't want you to answer the question that's in your head. They want you to answer the question that they have set. So that's band three, as we can see here. Now, we're not going to think about band four. We're going to skip band four because really what we're doing is we're aiming for those top marks, right? And that's what we're going to do in this session today. So we're going to think about how do we hit those top marks. So band five characteristics, 21 to 26 marks, 21 marks 
is just as you're getting over into your A. Okay, so you need to be in band five in order to be getting an A, usually as an interim that conversion to UMS marks, usually it's band five. And that would be the response is mainly focused on debating the key concept in the set question, covering most or all of the set period. The response considers most of the main developments, provides a convincing debate and is able to come to supported, balanced and appropriate judgment. That's your band five. But obviously we are aiming, we want to get to that band six. We want 30 out of 30 marks. So to get 30 out of 30 marks, according to the mark scheme that the examiners apply, it needs to, your response needs to be fully focused on the exact key concept in the question. Notice the word of the exact, right? Exact key concept in the question. Covering the whole of the set time period with a clear and convincing debate on the main developments and reaching a substantiated judgment in a lucid and fully coherent essay. So what we're going to do then for the sessions, we're going to pick each one of those underlying points in the band six and we're going to think how do we achieve each of those specific points. So we'll start with the first one, focusing on the exact key concept. Now, this is where the spotting of the historical concepts that we looked at last time is important. And we need to spot those historical concepts in the question. So all the questions set for unit one expect you to engage with a debate over an historical concept. And to do this effectively, you need to become skilled at spotting the concept and the evaluation that the question requires. Now, I've underlined requires because it's going back to what I said a second ago about it is that specific question you want to answer. So it's vitally important you ensure you answer the question set. And frankly, from my experience, and I know speaking to other teachers' experience as well, the key thing that usually lets our students down is that they don't answer the question set. They answer a question that's vaguely similar, that's a little bit similar, but isn't the specific one that was set. Now, this, though, frankly, is only natural, right? If you think about it, you've been learning content in all subjects since year 10 at a minimum, right? You might even have done exams, GCC exams, things like that in year nine. So that you're kind of used to that, you know about learning content, you know about using content, but it has only been for the last six months probably that you have actually written 30 mark essays. So you may well understand the topic brilliantly, brilliantly. you may well be able to write the best story in the world about the topic because that's kind of familiar to you, learning that content, but applying it specifically to that 30 mark essay is something that is new and something you really need to hone and work on and without working on you won't access those top marks right as they say practice makes perfect again i'll come on to that in a bit practice makes perfect churn out essays teachers lecturers will give you feedback and that way then you'll be able to improve and focus on those key concepts so if you were doing uh, an exam, obviously you're not doing an exam this year, but your teachers, your lecturers may well be using past papers as part of that evidence gathering. They would look like this, right? Unit one and then period eight is it's the, the uh, study, the option that I follow. You'd have in section A, you'd have two questions to choose from and in section B, two questions to choose from as well. So in going forward in this kind of evidence gathering process, as you might be aware of already from being back at school or college or going to happen after Easter, you'll probably have to do as part of that evidence gathering two questions um, to be submitted as if you were doing an exam paper almost, right, with 30 mark essays. So section A then is just simply a choice of two questions and usually covers a period between 15 and 40 years. Well, section B then, again, is a choice of two questions. You don't have to do four 30 mark essay questions. It's only two. And it will cover a period of more than 40 years. So section A is a bit more narrow in focus for time. Section B is a bit broader. So when you get given questions like that, or when you get given a question in class by your teacher to answer, the first things you need to do is you need to identify, number one, what is the factor in the question? Number two, what is the key concept which you will debate to reach an evaluation in that question? So we'll look at the, some of these together and try and, try and spot them, identify them together. So option one, right, on the Tudors, 
A question from an exam paper and over the last uh, three years was this, the threat posed by the nobility was the main challenge facing Henry VII in establishing the Tudor dynasty in a period from 1485 to 1509, discuss 30 marks. It's always going to be 30 marks. So our factor is the threat posed by the nobility. You're going to have to talk about the threat posed by the nobility because that's asked for in the question, but you're going to talk about other things as well other elements that feed into the key concept. A key concept being the main challenge facing Henry VII. So you're going to talk about the threat posed by the nobility as being a challenge faced by Henry VII, but you're going to talk about other things that are challenges faced by Henry VII, and crucially you're going to debate which of those is the main challenge focusing on Henry, sorry, facing Henry VII. And what I always do as well is I underline the years in the question as well. In this case, 1485 to 1509, just to really remind you and focus you in that you need to cover that whole time period to get in those band six marks, those top marks. So the second one uh, from the Stuarts and interregnum period, right? To what extent was religion mainly responsible for the challenges facing James III during his reign between 1603 and 1625? 30 marks. Well, our factor would be religion, and our key concept is to what extent were they mainly responsible for the challenges. So you talk about religion as being one of the challenges, but you'd be talking about other things that are challenges as well, and comparing how responsible they were in comparison to religion. And again, underline that time period. So the third question. England and Wales, 1780 to 1880. How far do you agree that the defects of the electoral system were mainly responsible for demands for parliamentary reform in a period from 1793 to 1832? I'll just give you 10 seconds, have a think. What could be the factor? What could be the key concept? Factor. Defect, uh, defects of the electoral system, the key concept, how far do you agree, they were mainly responsible for those parliamentary reforms. Again, underlining that time period, 1793 to 1832. Option four, England, Wales, 1880 to 1980. War was the most important influence on the changing role and status of women in Wales and England between 1914 and 1980. Again, 10 seconds, what's the factor? What's the key concept, have a think. The factor is war, the key concept is the most important influence. What you'll be doing is you'll be saying, was war the most important influence on that changing role and status of women? But you'll be comparing war to other things, right? Was it the, uh, uh, the cultural revolution in the 1960s? I don't teach this, so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that's what you've been taught about as well. Was it the cultural revolution in the 1960s that was an important influence? and then comparing which one of these different factors was the most important influence. And again, underlying that time period, 1914 to 1980. Some more for the following options. Uh, option five, politi poli uh, sorry, political and religious change in Europe. How successful was Charles V in dealing with the challenges he faced between 1516 and 1556? Well, we can say that the factor is Charles V and the key concept is how successful did he deal with those challenges? Option six, Europe, 1682 to 1815. To what extent was the growth of the bourgeoisie the main challenge facing Louis XV during his reign, 1715 to 1774? Well, the factor is the growth of the bourgeoisie. That's one of many things you'll be talking about as a challenge to Louis. But the key concept is to what extent was these or were these different factors the main challenge? You'll be debating throughout how big a challenge was the growth of the bourgeoisie? How big a challenge was that in comparison to other things? Option seven, revolution and new ideas. How far was the growth of Prussia mainly responsible for the creation of the United Germany in the period from 1850 to 1871? The factor being the growth of Prussia, the key concept, how far was it mainly responsible? 
So talking about the growth of Prussia, how was that responsible for the creation of United Germany? Talking about other factors, how were they responsible? And then which one was mainly responsible? And lastly, England and Wales, 1880 to 1980, the uh, lives of the Europe in the age of conflict and cooperation, the lives of the people of Russia were affected more by repression than by any other government action in the period 1905 to 1945. Well, the factor being repression, the key concept being affected more. Repression is just one thing that affected people in Russia at this time. So which thing affected those people more than anything else? So it's absolutely crucial when you get a question to highlight those three things the factor, the key concept, and underline that time period so you are specifically focused on the question that's been asked. Remember what I said about the, the biggest issue is students not answering the specific question. So if you've done this to the question, then you have set yourself in the best possible way you can to ensure that you answer that specific question. So literally, you open the exam paper, you get the essay question from your teacher, do that straight away so you are focused on exactly what you need to do. Now, these essays, how will they be worded? Well, they've always got similar question stems. There'll be a quote, discuss, or to what extent did something, something? How far do you agree? Something, something. How far was something, something? Or how successful? Something, something. Looking at the exam papers for all options in 2018 and 2019, these were the only ways that the questions began. So they're the only ways the questions that you will get will begin. And really, it doesn't matter how it's phrased, they want you to do the same thing. They want you to engage in a debate and they want you then to make a judgment. Now, they will always be on an issue that is stated on or closely linked to the specification as well. We looked at the specification last week or how to find it. It'll be specifically something that's on that specification. The question will be phrased in a way to promote a lively debate as well. It'll use words like mainly more to promote that debate. It'll cover a considerable period of time. So remember, you can't just cover five years. You need to cover that whole time period. The essay will let you sustain an argument throughout the answer. The essay should let you show accurate understanding of the relevant historical concept in the question and essay titles will include those key judgment words which will allow you to form a balanced judgment. For example, to what extent reclimate challenges the most serious problem facing Germany in the period 1918 to 1945. So I looked through all the uh, exam papers for uh, unit one or eight options between 2019 and 2018 and those key judgment words were mainly more, how successful or how effective or how far, most important, most significant, most effective, greatest. By using and focusing on those words, you can see it creates a debate. So for the example of a question down here, to what extent economic challenge is the most serious problem facing Germany in the period 1918 to 1945? If we'd taken that word most down, it wouldn't be a debate. If it was to what extent economic challenges a serious problem facing Germany in the period 1918 to 1945. You'd only need to talk about economic challenges and you'd really just be explaining how they were a challenge. By throwing in that word most, most serious problem, you can see that it's become a debate because now you need to compare economic challenges to other challenges. And then as part of that, you are analysing, looking at it from different perspectives, and then you're going to come to a judgment as well. So using those and focusing on those words, mainly more, etc., you focus on making it a debate and then bringing it together for a judgment at the end. So what you can do, you can even try and make your own questions, right? You can do it in your head now. So pick a question stem, a little quote, then discuss or to what extent. How far do you agree? How far was or how successful? Pick a specific piece of content from your specification for a factor. Pick a judgment word, mainly more, etc. Pick a specific content piece from your specica specification for a debate. Pick a time frame, throw in 30 marks, and you've got a question, right? Examples I've got here, to what extent did Mussolini, Mussolini mainly cause political change in Italy 
1922 to 1945? Or how far was Wolsey the cause of government reform in the period 1485 to 1603? Now, I'm not saying the examiners are going to take these and I'm going to throw them into the exam paper next year because Mr. Morrell has come up with some cracking questions. Probably not, right? I can see, you know, just looking at them now, there's, there's things the examiners might not like about them. But the idea still applies that you can kind of create your own question by applying this formula here. And in that way, then you can practice making more essays, drawing, you know, doing your debates, drawing your judgments together. So we've covered that first bit, fully focused on the exact key concept in the question. If we don't know what the exact key concept is, we're never going to be able to fully focus on it. So identify that key concept right at the beginning. How do you ensure you cover the whole time period and the main developments? Well, this really comes in your planning stage of writing your essay. So I like a good rag rating. OK, my suggested planning task for you here is to rag rate the key features and characteristics that you can use in this question, whatever question it is you'd answer. So to start your planning process, then I recommend you rag rate content that is related to the question you're answering. Just simply using three coloured highlighters, red, amber, green, to see whether or not the bits are directly relevant to your inquiry or not. So things that have little relevance, highlight in red. Things that have some relevance, highlight in amber. Things that are directly relevant, highlight in green. And it's those green ones you'll use in your essay first, and then you'll pick up those amber ones and include them if it's relevant or if you've got time. The red ones you probably won't bother with at all. So this is how I suggest you do it, right? If this was the question, the lives of the people of Russia were affected more by repression than any other government action in the period 1905 to 1945, then what I suggest initially is you break it down into the different time periods you could see. So we're talking about actions of the government. So between 1905 and 1945, we've got the Tsar's government. Then we've got a little blip of the dual power government. Then we've got Bolshevism under Lenin. And then you've got Bolshevism under Stalin. Now that way I'm signposting myself to ensure I cover the whole time period. I know I need to pull out bits from each of these different time periods. So that's what I'd start with doing, putting that in. And then I populate a table a bit like this, right, with the government actions. It's looking for specific government actions, isn't it? So all the government actions over this time period, right? The Tsar's government uh, took Russia to war with Japan. The Tsar's government introduced Stolypin and his uh, uh, policies of reform and repression. Bolshevism under Lenin introduced the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk in order to end the First World War. These are all things that the government did. So now I'm getting onto my rag rating. Red, which ones of these government actions are not directly relevant to the question lives of people of Russia were affected more by repression than any other government action. Amber, which ones are some relevance, have some relevance to the inquiry, and green, which ones are directly relevant. By highlighting those, by picking out those key specifics that are going to be important for my question, I'm already signposting myself to focus on the main developments and to cover the whole time period. And so I'm going into those band six marks. Yeah, covering the whole set period and focusing on those main developments. I have by do using that planning tool, I've done it. Now you in your head or you, if you're in an exam situation, you're probably thinking I don't have time to do that. You're right, you wouldn't have time to draw a table, but you could do it in your head. If you do it time and time again, as you're building up, as you're doing practice essays in class, or you're doing them at home, then you'd be able to do it in your head by the time you get into the exam. And it really doesn't take that much time at all once you've got into the practice of it and know what you're doing. So how do you ensure then you make a clear and convincing debate? Well, writing your essay quite simply is almost justifying your rank rating decision, justifying why you highlighted things as green, why are they directly relevant to the question? And to do this, you need to develop a difference between assertion and argument. Assertion is a statement or an opinion which is not supported by any reason or any further detail. You just stated it. An assertion would be justifying that, uh, sorry, an argument would be justifying that assertion 
with further reason, with detail, which explains or justifies something and counters the other arguments as well. So in order to do this, you could plan it out like this, right? In order to help move them from assertion to argument, read the example question below and then add um, support to each of your assertions to turn it into an argument. You could turn this into any question that you're doing, no matter what option it is you're studying. The main problem faced by France in the period 1841 to 1871 was in foreign affairs discussed. I should have put a little 30 marks in square brackets there afterwards, but you know that by now. So an assertion would be my point. You know, if, I, if I've taken it from my table on the previous slide, it's what I think is going to be relevant. That France had many problems in foreign policy in this period, which outweighed any other problems. That's my assertion, but I haven't backed it up with any detail. So in order to make it an argument, I need to provide support for this assertion. Another assertion could be another issue to consider is that the main problem faced by France was connected with the personality of Napoleon III. So again, that's your assertion, but it's not backed up. So you then provide support for that assertion. Another one, right? These, you know, these assertions could be a paragraph each by themselves. You make your assertion, this is your belief, and then you spend the rest of the paragraph providing support for that assertion. It can be argued that France's real problems were more long term and connected to the impact of industrialization on French society. That could be your assertion. Again, for it to be an argument, to be a debate, which you need, you need to provide support for that assertion. Why is that correct? Why is that going to be the main problem? For a debate to occur, you also need to analyse, right? And analyse basically is looking at something from more than one perspective or one point of view. And a really good way to do that is to use that on the one hand, however, on the other hand. If you're looking at it from a different perspective, you're saying on the one hand, so-and-so would have thought this. The ordinary population would have thought this. On the other hand, the king might have thought this. There's other things, right? In order to analyse, you could look at in terms of time, long term and short term. On the one hand, in the short term, this happened. However, on the other hand, in the long term, this happened. And you're looking at it from more than one perspective or point of view there. Same then with perspective, you could think about it from a political, economic, social, individual effects or combination of all of them. And then extent as well. On the one hand, this, uh, this and this had a small impact. On the other hand, if we look at this element, it had a much larger impact. And you are beginning to analyze. You're looking at those two viewpoints and you're putting them next to each other and you're discussing them and you are debating as a result. So in your arguments, as well as including specific evidence, if you also analyze the points too, you will have developed a convincing debate. And convincing is what you need. You want those examiners sat there going, yes, I buy every word of what this is saying. So a possible planning tool to help you with this, right, could be this in front of you here, right? And it helps to ensure you enter into the debate. So if you've got a question like how far do you agree that the Locarno Treaty was the most successful international agreement in the period between 1919 and 1938, then what you do, firstly, as I said earlier, in terms of breaking it down into the period, what have you got? Well, you've got your post-war peace settlements, 1919 to 1925, your Locarno spirit, and then your appeasement. So you're making sure you're covering all of those periods in order to cover the whole time period in the question. Then highlight the key features, right? We're thinking about what was most successful. And then you can split it up to have a section evidence that supports the idea that Locarno was the most successful international agreement. And then evidence to enter into debate about the proposition and evaluate the success of it. So something then, or lots of other things that suggest Locarno Treaty wasn't the most successful international agreement. Something that suggests the Locarno Treaty was limited in its success as well. Another example where I filled in a little bit more could be this one. The main cause of conflict between the Crown and Parliament in the period 1603 to 1642 was the issue of divine right. Discuss 30 marks. Well, firstly, my periods. Between 1603 and 1642, because we're clearly talking about the crown, right? We've got the reign of uh, King James I and the reign of King Charles I. So make sure we've got those. And then what we've got evidence to support the proposition. Well, we've got concept of divine right, the extent of the monarchy's adherence to and insistence on divine right and the significance and impact of divine right on relations with parliament. 
they all agree with the idea in the question. But conflict over finance, conflict with religion, conflict connected with radical MPs disagrees with the idea in the question, and so you're entering into a debate by using them. So again, another tool you could use in planning in order to pull out evidence that's for and against the question to enter into some sort of debate. So that's how you achieve your clear and convincing debate. But how do you reach a substantiated judgment? Well, a substantiated judgment starts with the introduction, right? And I say to write an answer in a nutshell. Essentially, overall, what is your argument going to be? It's not a whodunit novel. I don't want to know at the end who the murderer was. I want to know right from the very beginning who it was and what your argument's going to be. And as part of that, then you're defining your key terms. How are you going to argue that it is the most successful or has the greatest impact or whatever the key concept in the question is? And don't waste time in a long introduction, giving a long background of things that happened, punchy to the point. So my example here, what a good one looks like. If we had the question, to what extent were economic challenges the most serious problem facing Germany in the period 1918 to 1945? Well, this is what I'd say. There's no doubt that the economic challenges facing Germany were great between 1918 and 1945, as they often created, created a sense of insecurity. Without the perception of a stable economy, ordinary German citizens had no interest in the success of the government. However, this was a symptom of the most serious problem facing Germany, the instability of successive governments. So I'm also defining my key term here. I'm defining challenges or most serious problems, sorry, as being instability and insecurity. But I'm also answering it, you know, if I was, if I, if I had that essay question and I had two marks after it, that's what I'd write. It's an answer in a nutshell. I'm being really lazy. I'm writing a short answer. That's it. So that's how you can imagine it as well. Pull these together. Another example, right? If we had the lives of the people of Russia were affected more by repression than any other government action, 1905 to 1945 discuss. Well, my introduction would read, the governments of Tsar Nicholas, Lenin and Stalin used violence as a very basis of the government, inheriting the idea of repression from each other and as part of a cultural tradition. Although economic policies by governments such as Stalin's agricultural reforms and Stalin's collectivization had major impacts on people's lives, the actions were enforced by repression to prevent dissent, and so this had an overriding impact. Despite the repression being directed at a few people, the impact was great as it sent a wider message to the masses. So I'm defining my key term. What do I mean by affected? Well, I'm talking about the impact that it has in terms of sending message to the people. But also imagine that I had two marks at the end of it rather than 30. This is what I'd write. Yeah, I'd be writing three sentences and answer in a nutshell. So you start your substantiated judgment from your beginning. Right? It's not a whodunit. It's not line of duty where you find out at the end of the sixth episode what happened, or maybe at the end of the fifth series, you might find out what happened. I want to know right from the beginning. There's also a difference between big judgments and mini judgments. The exam board, your teachers, whoever it is that's marking these essays, want big judgments. They don't want mini judgments. Mini judgments are judged on just one point. Big judgments start to compare points together to make a wider judgment, to substantiate it. So an example of a mini judgment, so sorry, if we're doing this essay question here, how far do you agree that Russia was mainly responsible for the Cold War in Europe after 1945? A mini judgment following a paragraph about the Warsaw Pact might be that Stalin was responsible for escalating tensions by setting up the Warsaw Pact and taking direct military authority over some Eastern European powers armies. I'm just making a judgment on that one element. So it's a mini judgment. My big judgment could be this. The establishment of the Warsaw Pact was clearly an escalation of tensions as it saw the militaries of some Eastern European powers armies taken under direct control of the USSR in Moscow. It could be argued though that this was a defensive action in direct response to NATO's decision to allow West Germany to join just nine days earlier. With the perceived threat of West Germany joining NATO, it is no surprise that the USSR needed a military alliance to protect itself, but more importantly, East Germany, and shows a continuation of the attitude surrounding the justification for the Berlin blockade six years before. 
just a big judgment because I'm because because I'm comparing between different factors that I'm talking about in my essay and comparing it to NATO. I'm comparing it to the Berlin blockade. And so that becomes a big judgment. I'm starting to link between these different factors. I'm starting to make a judgment that compares. That is your big judgment. That's what you need to do. The more big judgments, the better. Now, really, my other top tips to reach substantiated judgment, plan well. What evidence can you use to back up and challenge your argument to ensure it is a debate? Planning well will help you enormously. Use the words of the question throughout. So you're signposting the examiner to you have the fact you are answering that specific question. If it asks you in the question uh, how effective was, use the word effective all the way through. And don't view each paragraph or idea in your essay in isolation. This is where identifying those key concepts, as we saw last session, is central. It's central for contextualising the essay, contextualising the point you make, point you're making, and it helps you to spot patterns and similarities, which help you to draw out that debate and crucially to make a judgment. Viewing things in isolation doesn't allow you to make a judgment about a question that specifically asks you to compare. So use the contextualization, use those key concepts to help you. And conclusion, don't view it as simply as a summary at the end of your essay of what you said, and so dedicate a very little amount of time to it, and equally don't integrate new ideas here either. Your conclusion is a place where you can tie any of those mini judgments together that you haven't already done so, and you can link them to be together, sorry, to be in your big judgment. Because examiners want big judgments where you're comparing and linking evidence between backing the proposition in a question and evidence you used to debate that proposition, linking them together specifically. So that's how we reach a substantiated judgment. We've only got one thing left, creating a lucid and fully coherent essay. Well, I'm afraid I haven't got any tools for that. How do you do this? Well, this is something that really can't be taught. It comes through flair. You having a bit of a flair, a bit of a passion. Practice. As I said earlier, practice makes perfect. Making it lucid and coherent is going to be based on you knowing how to write an essay and you knowing the content as well. An excellent grammar and vocabulary will be able to help you do that as well. If an examiner is struggling to read it because your grammar is poor, because you're using the same words again and again, that's not going to sound lucid and coherent. So vary it. Use good grammar and that will help the examiner do that. So that's how we reach our lucid and fully coherent essay. So between those steps we've got there, we would be able to hit the key points of that band six in the mark scheme. And remember that band six is top marks. These are 30 out of 30 essays. So really, really important that we're aiming for the top. Now equally, right, even if you think I'm never gonna get 30 marks, by doing your best to do each of those features, you will automatically start to head up that bands or those different band characteristics or different marks. The more you apply those different ideas, the simpler it will be for you eventually to move up those bands and achieve higher marks. So all that's left for me to say uh, before I see if there's any questions, is a massive thank you. Thank you very much for joining us over the last four weeks as we, both myself and Miss Thomas, have shared with you some of our top tips to succeed at History AS level. And quite frankly, after all of this, we wish you the very, very best in that evidence gathering. That's what it's all about, I suppose. And then going on into year 13 as well and trying to achieve the best possible A levels you can. Put those tips into action, right? Many of these ones I can give you for unit one also apply for unit three as well, what you'll do in year 13. And I'm sure Miss would say the same for much in unit two as well. So thank you very much for joining us. All the very, very best. And if you've got any questions, then we've got a couple of minutes. If you just drop them into the chat at the side, I will, uh, I'll answer as many as I can in the next couple of minutes. OK, interesting. Thank you, Zach. Good, that's a good question. Um, it is definitely not worth looking at password questions before 2018, in my, from my point of view, because 
they are quite confusing if um, if for certain options where they change the time period or they change the focus, it becomes quite difficult then to think what should I include because these were based on a different specification. So I would I would I would I, rec I recommend that you don't. I recommend that you look at as many as you can. There are also um, if you go on to the WJC, you don't have to um, dig too deep. If you go to the history AS level, you'll find what they call the specimen assessments, and in there they'll give you another raft of questions as well. What I suggest you do, rather than looking back through those past papers, is you ask your teacher or your lecturer, and they'll more likely be able to give you some uh, some questions that uh, are relevant and specific to what you are studying in your specific unit or option now. Any other questions? We've got just one more minute. Any other questions? OK, in that case, I think we are done. Well, thank you very, very much and all the very best of luck. Um, it is a nerve wracking time. It's nerve wracking for me as a teacher as well. So all the very best and um, good luck. And you can watch these again. Remember, by going to that website we shared with you last session um, and you can watch these recordings as many times as you want. Thank you very much. Goodbye.